All right, well, it's 1.30, so we go get, go ahead and get started. Uh, let's do this. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, uh, we'll go through this as normal. Um, the agenda is up. Um, we have Justin that'll go through some things, and then uh, Jacob's going to share some information on review and support, and then we have uh, Iluma that's going to go through some materials uh, between Jacob and Iluma, if there's any questions that come up from what Jacob said or what Justin said, we'll address them then. Um, our, we do have a webinar next week at on the 10th at 1.30. Um, if you have any questions, use the, uh, use the chat feature or uh, the Q&A and we will monitor that as much as we can. Um, any questions we're not able to address here or are um, ultra specific, we'll, we'll either direct them to disaster info or we'll use them for future guidance. So with that, Justin, you have the floor. Awesome. Um, can you let me share the screen? There we go, I think. It's not letting me. Okay, if it's not going to let me share the screen, Ed, can you go back and then navigate to the main special education webpage? All right, great. So I think I am sharing now. That's the one thing with Zoom is it doesn't always let you know what other folks are seeing. But um, I just wanted to share, we don't have necessarily specific um, updates for y'all or documents that have been created for y'all, but we did have uh, a, ser a couple of webinars yesterday with Partners Resource Network and some information was shared with parents that I think would be, uh, that y'all would, would want to see or might be helpful. You might find it useful in your interactions with parents or some information for them. So we're working on getting it put on the COVID page as well. Spedtex is going to post it and so up as Partners Resource Network, but uh, for right now, you can access it on, this is our um, main special education page. We scroll down to the bottom. There is a link for TEA recent presentations. And then it's these two documents right here, Partners Resource Network parent webinar from September 2nd. There's available, it's also available in Spanish. And uh, I'm not gonna go through the whole thing, but just to give you a flavor of I mean, it's just a Q&A, um, and, it's, and it's not new information. It's information that you all have also received in other ways. It's just uh, these are specific questions that parents asked, and um, <clears throat> with, in particular with regard to the interaction between compensatory services and a contingency plan, um, and then uh, compensatory services and uh, virtual instruction, and so how that sort of stuff interplays. And so might be of interest to you, and probably is also of interest if, if parents across the state have these questions, it's likely that parents in your LEA might have them as well because uh, our Partners Resource Network, as you all know, is a parent training institute for the entire state and uh, have a pretty wide, um, widespread across the state as far as uh, membership of folks who take advantage of their services. So I um, just wanted to bring that to your attention. That's the only thing new that we have for this week. Uh, it's broken into sections. Um, like I said, um, the first is around compensatory services and then contingency plans evaluations, and then uh, services. Several questions there. So um, that's all I had, Ed. If you have uh, anything else or you want to go ahead on with Jacob, we're good to go. I don't, I was on mute. I'm sorry. I don't have anything, so we can move on with Jacob. Great. Hey, Jacob. You're muted. Thank you, appreciate it. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Jacob Klett. I'm one of the directors in the Department of Review and Support. I uh, just wanted to briefly share some beginning of year uh, monitoring activities that LEAs can anticipate uh, between now in September and December in the 2020-2021 school year. So let me share my screen. So 
Okay. All right, hopefully you're all seeing uh, my screen. So uh, starting in September, um, the cyclical monitoring phone conferences for LEAs who received their notification of monitoring at the end of July, uh, those phone conferences with LEAs and their assigned point of contact uh, for their cyclical review will begin. And those phone conferences will be for those LEAs in cycle two, group one, as well as the LEAs who have monitoring activities that were rescheduled from the end of the 2019-2020 school year that had to be rescheduled due to uh, COVID-related closures. Uh, so between September 8th and September 25th, those phone conferences will occur uh, with LEAs and the point of contact with review and support. Uh, reviewers will begin outreaching to LEAs um, in the coming weeks to coordinate times and logistics for scheduling those phone conferences. Uh, during those initial phone conferences, uh, there will be discussion of the, the details of monitoring activities, um, including establishing timelines for providing artifacts or materials needed for the review, uh, as well as sample size requirements and next steps uh, related to the cyclical review. Those activities, cyclical monitoring activities, will actually begin in October. Um, and those activities include the policy review, uh, the sharing of a stakeholder survey, uh, which will be used to obtain uh, qualitative information from stakeholders in the LEA, as well as, of course, the comprehensive desk review, and for some LEAs, virtual on-site reviews. Uh, it's important to note that regarding the virtual on-site review, that's not a required component for all LEAs. Uh, so make sure to reference the notification that uh, was received in July. Uh, if that notification references on-site activities, um, then that part of the cyclical review is applicable. Uh, for those LEAs who will not be engaging in an on-site review, uh, that information is not included in their uh, notification that was, uh, that was sent out at the end of July. Uh, then in November, of course, uh, we had to delay the release of our LEA self-assessment for special education. Uh, so that delay was announced uh, in the spring and at the end of April. Uh, so in November, LEAs can anticipate receiving notification regarding uh, the self-assessment and what to expect moving forward. Uh, the self-assessment will become available for LEAs uh, following the new year in January, but more information to come on that, so watch for that to come in November 2020. Uh, the cyclical monitoring activities for LEAs again in cycle one, uh, group three, and for cycle two, group one. Those activities will conclude in December. And then also in December, targeted monitoring notifications related to the release of RDA 2020 for LEAs to obtain a determination level of three or a determination level of four for special education in the RDA 2020 framework including both desk reviews and on-site reviews in the targeted monitoring pathway. So those notice, notifications of monitoring will be distributed to LEAs in December. The other item that I would like to share with you and excited to share with you this afternoon are some available resources and support uh, to support LEAs with monitoring and also uh, as universal support for LEAs regarding uh, common concerns or challenges that were noted in um, monitoring activities conducted in 2019-2020 prior to COVID closures. So some of those items, uh, and I'll walk you through where to find those on the website momentarily. Uh, there's a differentiated monitoring and support one pager available. That is on our main page. That is really just a high level resource that will walk through the components of the, the differentiated monitoring and support system and the diagnostic framework that underlies all of our monitoring effort. The differentiated monitoring and support guide for 2020 is now available on the website. Uh, that includes information that's been updated to align to RDA 2020, uh, including updated sampling requirements for the cyclical review uh, that were made between 2019, 2020 and the current school year. Also very excited uh, to announce that we have a Differentiated Monitoring and Support Overview Interactive e-learning module available. I'll show you where that can be found. 
Uh, that resource is available to LEAs to support them in walking through the components of the differentiated monitoring and support system. There's also a study guide companion document uh, that accompanies the e-learning module that participants can download and, and use to uh, track the different elements of the learning module. And then finally, we have a trending topics newsletter that we've begun distributing to LEAs uh, in the 2018-2019, or uh, following the 2018-2019 school year. Uh, we anticipated scheduling or sending those out uh, following cyclical monitoring group activities uh, throughout the year in 2019-2020. And of course, that distribution was disrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so issue two of that series was released in August and is uh, posted and available on the Review and Support website. So you might be wondering where to find all of these resources. Our website is linked here on the bottom of the slide. And I'm gonna jump over to that now and just walk you through where you can locate these resources as well as a couple of others that may be uh, useful as you engage in monitoring activities uh, at the beginning of the year. Let me just shift over. There. All right, uh, so let me just walk through how to find the review and support page from the TEA main page. Uh, of course, we're under academics. And then if you scroll down uh, to the second row under special student populations, uh, there is review and support. I'm gonna click there. And I'll show you first the DMS one pager. That's actually right here on the main page under support and customer service. There's a link, DMS overview, one pager. I can click on that link. That's gonna launch that one page document that I referenced just a moment ago. Uh, and again, this is just a high level, quick overview of the differentiated monitoring support system and the underlying diagnostic framework. Additionally, I scroll back up under differentiated monitoring and support, DMS guidance. Here's where I can find the monitoring guide that's been updated for 2020. You can click here to launch that. And this is the comprehensive guide to monitoring activities. And again, this has been updated to align with the RDA framework in uh, release in 2020, and also includes updated cyclical monitoring sampling criteria. Um, if I scroll down, I also want to showcase where to find the cyclical monitoring schedule. Uh, so if you have not received notification of monitoring either uh, in 2019-2020 or in the current 2020-21 school year, you might be wondering when your LEA is scheduled for your cyclical review. To find that information, uh, just here on this DMS page, you'll see three buttons cycles one and two, cycles three and four, and cycles five and six. You can launch those, and you'll see the full uh, comprehensive schedule of all LEAs across the state for all six cycles. And so if you're wondering where your, LEA, where your LEA falls in the cyclical schedule, uh, these resources can help you obtain that information. Let's jump back to the main page. and scroll down to the button that says resources. Under resources, sorry, you'll see differentiated monitoring and support e-learning series. We do anticipate having a series of three e-learning modules available uh, when the series is fully developed. At this time, we have the first of three available, which as I mentioned earlier, is the differentiated monitoring and support system overview module. Um, this module would take participants about 20 to 30 minutes to complete, and it does walk through the DMS system, including the cyclical pathway and the targeted pathway for monitoring, uh, as well as potential outcomes for uh, LEAs that may engage in that differentiated monitoring and support system. Uh, to launch that module, there's a link right here, the differentiated monitoring and support system overview. If I click that, 
that's actually going to launch the module. Uh, I can hit this play button to initiate it. Uh, it is interactive. It does have some interactive elements and built-in checks for understanding to support the participant in learning about the DMS system. And there's also a DMS system overview study guide that you can launch by clicking the link below the module. Uh, this is something that participants can download or print, uh, whatever your preference may be, and support in navigating through the different components of the module and capturing notes about any of the content. Also want to show you. Jacob, there was one question. Sure. Um, so maybe you could just show it to show, like, I don't know if the, I know that there's sometimes there's issue with cache and, and having old versions saved and people, um, someone posted that when they click on the monitoring guide link, it shows a 2019 document. Thanks for that, Ed. Yeah, so that may just be a browser cache issue. Um, if you go into your browser settings and clear your stored history or clear your cache, it, it should reset. And then when you click on that link again, it, it should load the 2020 guide. I actually had the same thing happen as soon as it went live. Um, gave me a moment of panic and, and then uh, was able to clear the cache and reset it. Another question was, uh, someone posted that they've heard that the requirements are changing for review and support again. Is that true? I think that might just be confusion with your test group. I'm not sure which requirements um, are being referenced there. There have been adjustments to some of the timelines uh, regarding self-assessment, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we had anticipated being able to roll that out for the 2020-21 school year. Um, due to COVID, we've delayed the rollout of that um, until January 2021. Um, and so, as I mentioned, LEAs can anticipate receiving more information about the self-assessment in November. Uh, the cyclical sampling guidance has been adjusted for the 2020-21 school year, uh, and that adjusted guidance is included in the uh, in Appendix B of the Differentiated Monitoring and Support Manual. Okay. All right. Uh, I wanted to showcase just where to find that trending topics newsletter as well. And so again, I'm back on the review and support main page here. And if I scroll down, on the, toward the bottom of the page, you'll see trending topics in special education and click this link. And here you can access both issue one that was released at the end of the 2018-2019 school year. So if you're interested in viewing the prior issue and the topics that were included there, uh, clicking issue one will launch those links to the newsletter. And then you can see the bullets will uh, indicate the content that's included in that issue. Issue two is the, the one that I highlighted earlier on the slide. Uh, this is the one that was released last month in August. Um, and that one contains information regarding properly constituted art committee meetings, uh, IEP development, and then uh, several areas of uh, post-secondary transition for students with disabilities. Um, so again, just clicking on issue two, We'll launch that newsletter. Uh, within the newsletter, if you're really only interested in one or a couple of the topics, you can actually just use these links on the top. Uh, if I wanted to jump right to connecting the community resources under transition, just click there and it'll take me down to the bottom. I can see the resources and the description of that resource and then a link uh, to actually access that, that link resource. Jacob, I would just, this is Justin, I would just jump in and let folks remind folks that the training topics, whenever one of the, whenever a new one is published, we link that in our general special education newsletter as well. So if they're subscribed to that, um, you should, and you'll know it's immediately when we publish a new training topics. So. Great. Thanks for that plug, Justin. Yep. That, that's a really good place to find that as soon as it, as soon as it becomes available. All right, Ed, uh, that, that's all I've got for today. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thanks, Jacob. I um, appreciate that. So uh, I know I answered this. Um, we will send out the two slides that Jacob shared. We'll just send them out to the same way folks get the information on the meetings. So um, I know last time I said listserv and that wasn't correct. I think it goes out to the directors through Ask Dead. Is that the right way I should say that, Justin? 
It is, and the only reason that we that we um, harp on that a little bit is that that's our most up to date information to make sure we are place to make sure we're getting to every single uh, director in the state. And so, uh, if you haven't been getting that stuff, it it isn't helpful for you to email us and ask us because we don't have any control over who's an ask head. So, if you haven't been getting this email to the uh, invitation to this, and you are the director for your LEA. To contact whoever it is in your LEA is responsible for updating Ask Ted. It's usually a data person. I make sure that they do that for you because that's we pull that regularly um, whenever we go just to make sure that we have the latest list. So. Okay, great. And then I know Jennifer just responded to one of the other questions in the chat. Um, so with that, we'll turn it over to uh, the folks at um, Iluma that we're going to share some information about what they offer and what they do. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Chad uh, Gundry. And sorry, before Chad, before you start, sorry to interrupt, I just want to reiterate for folks that um, if, if you're not interested in vendor presentations, then there, there's no more TEA presentation at this point. Uh, and just reiterating these presentations are as a result of requests from the field. And so that's why we're giving this time on the TEA webinar uh, to various vendors across the board. So um, folks don't feel like you have to stick around if you don't want to, but um, we hope that you do because I have good information to share, but it's, um, it's up to, uh, it's up to you. Okay. So with that, I will turn it over to uh, Chad and Jeremy. Well, thank you, Ed. And thank you, Justin, for um, inviting us to come and share some information. Uh, like Justin said, hopefully you find this information valuable. We'll share a little bit about us, best practices, um, hopefully some things that you can take away and, and implement into your, your own districts. My name is Jeremy Glauser, and I'm the founder and CEO at Iluma, and I am joined by Chad Gundry. I'm located um, in Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, just before I came here, I, I lived in Corpus Christi, Texas. have a lot of family in that area, and for me, it's, it's truly about trying to make a difference for you as administrators and educators, but also for the kids, right? These kids need supports with specialized online instruction. So Chad, I'll turn it over to you. Just introduce yourself a little bit. Yeah, just really quick. So I, I live in Katy, Texas. Um, when I'm, I'm one of y'all kind of thing. Um, I have a passion for kids. I, I, I actually oversee all the contracts and uh, business development in Texas. And I work with several districts here and I'm in, in fact, in the hotel right now in Odessa, uh, just implementing some services up here in, um, in this area with the school district. And, and I just love the kids. My wife's a sped teacher and, and I have a lot of passion for this. And so this online therapy solution has been such a, a godsend to uh, many, many administrators and, and helping a lot of students right now. So I'm happy to be here and share our solution. Absolutely. I, I will share my screen now. Hopefully you can see this. Uh, you should be able to see that on the screen there. We won't take up a lot of your time, but hopefully we bring value to you and we help um, show you some solutions that, that you could ultimately implement in some way or another. But uh, really for us, it, it does come up from a place of passion and a place of helping and serving the, the kids who are oftentimes on the margins or underserved or harder to, to get to. We want to build equity across these services that students so desperately need. And uh, one of our team members who couldn't make it here today, um, but uh, we want you to know as part of our team here in Texas is Lydia McCrumman. And uh, I'm sure that you'll interact with any one of us uh, or we'll interact with you at some point. But one of the interesting things is, is about a decade ago, it was becoming pretty clear that there was a growing um, shortage of, of specialized providers. Talking about speech therapists, occupational therapists, mental health counselors, and and uh, some of these statistics have, have really made it incumbent upon us to think about meeting kids' needs in a different way or supplementing what we're currently doing with some new ways of thinking. 
And you may be aware with this already, but about one in two educators in special ed, including specialized providers, exit the workforce within five years. And 45% of all SLPs are within 10 years of retirement. We estimate that the shortage is somewhere between eight and 10,000 unfilled openings for speech, about 15,000 unfilled openings for school psych, and um, more than 50,000 unfilled openings for special ed teachers. And, and so it's been really interesting to see how the needs of students and the, the supply of educators and specialized providers are going in opposite directions. And it might seem a little bit scary. It might seem a little daunting, especially now that we're living in a, in a pandemic and we're launching this school year with all sorts of different options, right? Online 100%, hybrid with online and on-site instruction. But what I think brings hope and brings a really good forecast to the future is that online therapy is one solution, not the only solution, but one very good solution. And ASHA put out a report that, that uh, surveys the, all the SLPs in their community. And we find it really interesting and insightful to know that more than half of them will re-enter the workforce after having exited for these four reasons. Finding a part-time position, more flexible hours, less paperwork, lower caseloads. So obviously online instruction is a good case for that. And we encourage you to be open-minded to those possibilities. But even here at Iluma, it's one of the main reasons that we are able to help pro bring providers back into the workforce and fill in so many of the gaps. And to the point that we've had over 10,000 applicants in speech, OT, mental health, school psychology, special educators. And we're trying to democratize access where those services are needed the most. So I wanna share just a little bit about how we're doing that and, and, and hopefully you can see the vision and get some more functional ideas as you walk away with this. But we've been doing it for almost 10 years and we've accrued a lot of experience uh, serving over 16,000 students, very invested in, in Texas, but 34 other states as well. And all of this information has led us to create services and software that solve this very need that we're living right now, a hybrid situation where we have to have online services in order to meet the needs of every student. So to do that, we provide speech therapy and assessment. We do occupational therapy and assessment. We do mental health counseling as well as school psychology and assessment. And we found that these are areas that we are really good at, that we have a great, great process for. And what's more is we've been able to develop relationships with, with publishers. I know in talking with Justin and others that assessment is a big topic of concern right now, meeting those timeframes and making sure that the kids get the, the initial or reavals that have to be done. And so we've worked with Pearson and ProEd and WPS um, MHS and others to adapt those assessments for remote delivery so that we can administer them with the same kind of defensible outcomes, the same kind of standardization. And so it is very possible to do assessments if it's implemented the right way. And the same goes for any kind of these services, right? When we set it up right, we set it up well, we do good change management and have good professional development surrounding it we can achieve some really great results, even in an online instruction setting. So therapy um, can be done one-on-one -on -one or in groups. The big difference is when you do online instruction, typically you like to keep those groups to no more than three at a time. For behavior and really effective therapeutic uh, interventions, we, we keep those groups to a maximum of three. So anywhere from one to three students in a session, can be very highly effective. And, and these can take place at school or at home, of course. You know that. You were thrown into this in the spring and, and had to figure it out. The good thing is we have figured it out and we can help. And when it's done in school, there are different ways to set up a therapy station. And these are some examples of how a therapy station for online delivery 
can look. So a resource room, a library, a computer lab are all good places. What's critical is that we have a good internet connection, good computer, good webcam, good headset, and ensure that there's some privacy, right? So in a resource room where you have a teacher working with small groups, you can see a student in the, the back of the room on a computer doing an online therapy session. That's a great setup. And the setup can be uh, carried out or, or the delivery can be executed in a few different ways. There are three main models that we have found are very effective when it comes to online delivery. And any one of these can be done um, in a school. And then, and then we can obviously adapt when services are done at home. It's the same basic requirements of a, of a computer and an internet connection. So the mobility of modality is pretty seamless. The first model is, is what we call the traditional model because it follows the same rules as if you're an on-site SLP, OT, mental health provider. The Illuma online therapist or your online therapist for that matter will just connect through Illuma's platform through video conferencing and students join from their computer station and connect with the therapist in real time. So it's a live synchronous interaction with the elements of interactive games, content, engagement tools, and that makes for a really seamless experience on the student's end. And therapists online can attend IEP meetings through video conference. They can write the IEP goals. They can enter progress reports and create progress reports. They can participate in team or staff trainings and meetings. So anything that an online therapist can do, uh, or an on-site therapist can do rather, an online therapist can do in a different way. And it's a little paradigm shift. The second model is a supervisory model, and this is more applicable with an on-site team. So if there is an aide or a qualified assistant who is providing the direct thera therapy to the students, then an online therapist can, can supervise through teleconferencing. So imagine an OT supervising an OTA or CODA who's on site, and it looks much like you see here in the circle on the right side. And then an SLP supervising an SLPA or a qualified uh, or an credentialed professional who can do that direct therapy under the supervision of an SLP. And then the third model is doing this in tandem. And this is where we divide and conquer and we really partner and integrate with the on-site team. So the online therapist might serve students in the lower grades of an elementary, whereas the on-site therapist may serve the students in the higher grades of an elementary. And together they divide and conquer and they serve the needs of all the students in that particular school. It can also be divided and conquer in the sense that one therapist, the online Illuma therapist works with certain buildings and the on-site therapist works with other certain buildings. There are lots of ways to divide and conquer. It's very much customized to the needs of the caseloads. But what we want to share today is that, that even though we're in a very new situation in education, this isn't new to Eluma. And we want to be partners with you. We want to consult with you. Whether you use our services or you use our platform in the future or you don't, we want to connect with you and we want to help you. So we invite you to reach out. We invite you to, to bring your ideas and, and we would be happy to sit at the table and consult with you and provide some input to you and really ultimately help all of us weather this pandemic and figure out how to get great education to the kids that need that so badly. We'll send out this slide deck which has additional resources to follow and uh, we are glad to stick around for a few minutes and answer any questions that you may have for Chad or myself. And Ed, Justin, or Jennifer, I I'm not sure if we will turn it back to you if you have questions that, that you'd like us to answer or if we um, maybe we can just put our email in the chat and people can reach out with questions afterwards. How would you like to approach that, Ed? Um. I think, I think we can definitely put, you guys can definitely drop your uh, contact information in the chat. 
Um, I need to send out, we'll have to send out Jacob's slides as well so we can include it in the email okay. when we send out Jacob's slides. Um, I think, I know we haven't gotten the question here, but I know Justin and I have gotten the question before is like, um, you did touch on a little bit about like group in, in a web-based scenario. Um, that might be something to talk about because I do know that that's come up with other folks is um, how do you, how do you make, how do you make group therapy work in an, in a virtual setting? Right. Now are you, are, are we assuming that the, the school is the location or is the question more focused on group therapy when students are at home learning online? I, I would definitely say it's probably the latter. Okay. Yeah. So one thing to be aware of is you will want to consult or talk as a team to make sure you don't violate uh, privacy and confidentiality, especially when students are in a group and they're at their home. Um, I've seen some districts interpret the privacy and confidentiality as it should just be one-on-one -on -one because if a student is at home, you, you really don't know if a sibling or a parent is, is also tuning in to that therapy and the, the group of students might not uh, want for that to happen, right? So I've seen other districts who will send out a confidentiality release form or a privacy and confidentiality form. And students who are online are required to agree to those confidentiality measures. It is something that is, uh, is important to take into account. But what I will tell you is that we as an organization do it successfully um, with thousands of students in, in many different states, but it always is preceded with a confidentiality or release of information so that the student can participate in a group. Okay. Uh, it looks like there's another question here. Do you have a minimum number of hours per month requirement? Yeah, typically we're looking for, for a caseload of 10 students. And the main reason for that is we found that that's a big indicator in our ability to, to identify a therapist who's committed long term, who's the right fit. And so typically we're looking for a caseload of 10, uh, but can handle any number much larger. So we work with, we work with schools that are, are relatively small caseloads, but up to four, five, six, and, and 800 students. So we're um. How would that work with, how was, does that work with uh, shared service agreements where you have districts that come together and pool resources? Very, very smart and creative and absolutely we want to work in those scenarios, right? So if there are collaborative agreements, it's not that we don't want to help students. It's that we want to help students the best we can. And so if districts are willing to, to come together and help us get to that number, then of course we would love to help in that scenario. Good question. Okay. And, I, and I would say add something to this as well. Uh, the way our, our billing is, is, is on a per student basis. It's not like just give us all the hours. It's we, the pricing is based on per student and that per student cost is simple. It includes all the direct and indirect time, all your caseload, um, mm -hmm. all the billing, all the scheduling, everything that the online therapist would do is included in that one cost. Yep. The only exception to the to that would be an assessment because we can't predict those. So the per student includes everything and then and then an assessment is just a separate a separate thing. Okay. Well, I saw both of you guys dropped your contact information in the chat um, and we'll send it out tomorrow when we send out the slides. Um, and then obviously anybody can access this recording within 48 hours because we posted to the website. So thank you guys for taking some time this afternoon with us. Hey, thank you so much. And uh, we appreciate the support. We, we wish you all the best. You're doing awesome. We will, we'll, we'll make this happen, right? Great. Um, and for everyone still on the call, have, enjoy the long weekend, get some rest, and uh, we'll see you guys next week.